42 to 47. Okay, I will read. Uh, it's on the fellowship of the believers. 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with, with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day, they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. The next reading is Colossians 3, 1 to 10. Living as those made alive in Christ. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is. Seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. For you for you died, and your life is now hidden in Christ, in God. When Christ, who is your life, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of this, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived. But now you must also rid yourselves of all, the, all such things as this. Anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other. Since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. This is the word of the Lord. Okay. You're welcome. Yes, I'll pray for Pastor Haran. Our loving Father, we continue to thank you, Lord, for this day. We continue to thank you for your presence here with us, Lord. And we thank you in a very special way for our Pastor Haron, Lord. We, we thank you that, Lord, you're, we, we know that you're going to use him, Lord, to speak to us, Lord. We pray that, King of glory, we may get to experience your goodness, your love, and your grace through, uh, through our speaker, Lord. And we pray, Lord, that indeed, King of glory, we may leave this place, place nourished and uh, filled with your goodness, O oh Lord. That, Lord, we may go and... Uh, Continue spreading your word, O oh Lord, and we may leave this place uh, never the same again, O oh Lord. We worship you, Lord, and we cover our pastor with your, with your, with your grace, Lord, that indeed, Lord, uh, he may minister to us and uh, he may bring out uh, your word in a, in a way that, Lord, indeed, we'll understand and it may stick in our minds, O oh Lord, and we may live by it. We thank you, we love you, and we adore you. In Jesus' name we pray and believe. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Winnie. I, I hope now I can be heard. Uh, good afternoon. It's just afternoon. Yeah, I don't know whether you are very tired of sitting. Uh, I wish we can have one song. We just uh, praise the Lord as we get ready to hear the word. Uh, you can be sure not to take so long. Yeah, uh, Sister Carlo, come and lead us in a song. <laughs> um, we worship the Lord together as we get ready to hear the word, and we can stand. We can we can be on our feet. Uh, you got a song? Uh, 
Unastahili kuabudiwa Unastahili ewe Yesu Unastahili kuabudiwa Unastahili mwana wa mabwana Unastahili kuabudiwa Unastahili Thank you so much, Winnie, for leading us. Uh, I know we had quite a number of things, including some technical challenges, and uh, I know there was a highlight that was to be made on missions. Um, but uh, we want to thank God that we are a family, and God is going to help us and be gracious to us, even as we listen to his word. Um, but I think it would be expected for me to say something about mission highlight on the medical camp. Uh, just to say that the medical camp is on on 21st and 22nd of this month. Are you praying about it? I hope that you are praying. In spite of anything else that you may do or not do, we can all pray and trust God that it will go well. And we are continuing to collect uh, dry foods uh, to, to give to particularly the uh, center there where we will be having the medical camp and you are welcome to bring that and also any other kind of contribution and you can see the mission account there is projected including the pay bill uh, so we continue receiving and trusting God that we will have all the resources we need. Now, the word of God has been read to us, and we are looking at matters family, because families matter. Families are very important, and we all belong to a family, and today we are looking at the sacredness of the family. I know that last Sunday we looked at the foundation of the family, and how our families need to be strong on the foundation of trusting in God and putting our faith fully in Him. And uh, as we do that, it is not possible if we do not see what value God puts in the family from what He had in mind at the beginning. And so that is what we are going to be looking at. The sacred issues, the things that need to be done in order to glorify God in our families. And um, how is that table around the families? I'm hoping that our families have time to sit around the table. What should we be doing? What are some of the mo most important values that we need to be upholding as we live together as a family? And I would want to begin by saying that unless we understand God's purpose for the family, we would not take it seriously and see the very fundamental things in God's sight that we need to be upholding as a family. And have you ever thought of, we know that we talk about the purposes of us as individuals. But does God have a purpose for the family that you belong to? For the family that you have? Does he have a mission? Does he have something that he wants to accomplish in your life as that family? And this is what I would want to say, that indeed God has a purpose. 
and that purpose can only be understood through understanding what he expects us to be doing as a sacred unit that God has started. And the sacredness of the family is because it is God's idea. It has come from God. Anything that God has established is set apart for him. It is holy. It has to be done unto him. And it has to be done in ways that will ensure honor and holiness due to him. And uh, the family, in the way that it is begun, and the way that it is run, needs to be that honored, that sacred, that God esteeming. And if you look at Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 4, it tells us the, the, the sacredness, the sacredness of beginning a family. I don't know how you have begun your family or the family you belong to was begun. Sometimes even how we get into marriage. And the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 13, these are some, of, some things that Paul, or, or the writer, sorry, was needed to emphasize as he brought this uh, writing into conclusion. And in verse 4, um, the Bible says, marriage should be honored by all and the marriage bed kept pure, for God will judge the adulterer and all the sexually immoral. Marriage must be honored by all. And that is the beginning of family. Families come through the union of a husband and wife. And it needs to be done in ways that honor God. And um, we know that not all our marriages may have been done in ways that God was honored, but in spite of how we came together, God wants us to honor him in that marriage and in that family because he wants to accomplish a purpose through that family. And what is God's purpose for the family? I want to look at just three scriptures that can help us to see this that God wants to do through the family. In uh, 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse, verse 4, I want to read these scriptures and uh, just leave them for you to think about them. Uh, 2 Peter chapter, four and, uh, chapter 1 and verse 4, Through this, he has given us his very great and precious promises, so that through them you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption in the world because of evil desires. God wants that we as individuals can escape corruption, can be uh, uh, brought into the new nature, the new nature through Christ to be, um, to be like God, to be what God expected us to be from the beginning and to escape the corruption. There is a lot of corruption against us as individuals, but the same thing he wants to see in our ent entities at the units of families. And it is because family is the basic building block through which God wants to bring the much needed change and transformation in the world at the restoration of man. It will happen through the agents of individuals, but in the unit of the family. And so he wants that families will escape the corruption that is in the world. And we heard about that even last time uh, when we were told about the many ways that even families are being defined today. But the other scripture is part of the text that has been read to us in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 10. I want to look at the most fundamental things that you, I, I would wish that we do not forget even at the end of this, uh, after, uh, the end of this uh, sermon. And verse 10 says, um, 
Right, let me read verse 9. Do not lie to each other since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self which is being renewed in the knowledge and the image of its creator. That is what God wants to happen in our lives that we will be renewed in the knowledge and to be in the image of our creator. That does not just apply to us as individuals, but he wants it to apply within the context of our families where we belong. And in Acts chapter 2, verse 47, part of what has also been read to us, chapter 2, verse 47, the Bible says, Praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people, and the Lord added to their number daily those who are being saved. God wants additions, wants growth, wants increase in our families. And those are things that are within the purpose of God for us. He wants that through us there can be increment. And those are the things that I will be looking at maybe more closely as I go through these scriptures. Let's look at the first thing in, in achieving this one purpose, this purpose that God has, and I want us to see that it is beyond us as individuals to the circle of the closest influence that we need to have, and that is our families, whether we are married or not, but there are those who are close to us, and God wants that this change and transformation and restoration that he is bringing to the world may be experienced and we can say first from the family. Because if it is not experienced in the family, it will not be experienced in the society. Let's look at Acts chapter 2, the one that has been read to us, verse 42 to, uh, to 47. What should be happening around the family for it to achieve this one purpose that God has for it. The first thing is what we see in verse 42, devotion. There needs to be devotion to what? The Bible says teachings. But I want to see it even more broadly as coaching of what you can say mentorship of what you can say apprenticeship. Apprenticeship is close to what uh, we call discipleship. That needs to be happening in the family if there will be transformation and if there will be the much needed change that we want to see out there. Just as the statement goes that change begins with us, begins with me, the same thing we should say, that change must begin with my family. And in this family of the church that had started with the apostles, there are these very key things that they were doing, and which I believe, as a family, this is what should be happening. The church is also a family. The Bible says that in Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 15, and also we know that the nation is also considered as a family. But the smallest unit of that bigger family is the family where we are. And we want to see that devotion happening. Devotion to what? To teachings. And um, I want to see these teachings as impartation not just of knowledge, but impartation of a lifestyle and development of skills that can enable that family unit, be it the, uh, the husband and the wife and the children, to be able to live effective lives in this world. Remember, as we have seen in Second Peter chapter 1 and verse 4, that God wants us to escape this defilement and this corruption that is in the world. And the family needs skills to be able to do that. And that needs to begin through the teachings. But those teachings also need to be demonstrated. 
and they need to uh, ensure that we empower each other to be able to live in them, to live in those teachings. Because it's one thing for us to teach, and we do that, I could be teaching here today, but the people who know whether I demonstrate those teachings are those who are close to me. You can look at even what uh, was being done here. It's about the doctrines of the apostles' teachings. And that is the authority that had been given to the apostles by God to bring the revelation of the message of uh, the love of God and salvation through Jesus Christ. And this is what we have been entrusted, especially as leaders within the family, that these apostolic teachings, these authoritative teachings from God need to be coming to our table. And another thing is about prayer. And if you think about prayer, prayer cannot be effectively taught. It can only be demonstrated. It can only be lived. It can only be seen to be done. Because we can say many things about prayer, we can talk about prayer, but unless we, if we do it, and do it in that closet of the family, then nothing will happen, even in the church. It needs to begin there, and it needs to be demonstrated. My children will only be able to pray, usually as they see me pray. And uh, I know that in our family we try to ensure that everyone gets involved in leading devotion and also in prayer so that they can learn praying and it is not just hearing about prayer. So we are talking about coaching where it is about impartation of knowledge but also that knowledge being demonstrated in life by those that God has given the authority in the families to do that and to lead that. And one of the biggest challenges in Christianity today is transferring this faith and this life to the next generation. The God is God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And we need to see that God, not just being God of Haran, but it needs to be God of Abraham, his son, and Miriam and Emma, it needs to be transferred to the next generation. That is actually one of the greatest challenges as families and as leaders in the families we need to take up. And in Acts chapter 2 verse 39, before this scripture uh, that, we have, uh, that has been read to us, the Bible says that this promise and this blessing and this joy of being saved and being filled with the Holy Spirit. Remember, it was just after the Holy Spirit had come upon the disciples. The Bible says that that promise is for us with our children, with those who are near and those who are far. And in Proverbs chapter 13 and verse 2, this is one of the scriptures that are usually... Um, read to us and we are told to think about uh, storing riches and blessings to our children but also to our grandchildren. And let me read it to us. Chapter 13 and verse 2. The Bible says, um, I hope I a wise son heeds uh, the father's Am I reading the correct one? I hope I got it correctly. Okay. But it talks about a good man leaving his wealth to his children, and not just to his children, but to his children's children. And many times we think about the wealth and what we can leave behind in terms of material things. But have we been thinking about what we will leave behind for our children and grandchildren as far as the sacred things of the teaching of the doctrine of the apostles and prayer are concerned. And this is what we want to emphasize today, that there could be a lot of focus on what we can do, especially to 
safeguard our children's life in the days to come as far as material well-being is concerned. But how much are we doing that? And it will actually be judged not just with our children, but with our grandchildren. It's like if you want to see how effective I will be in my life as a Christian and how influential I will be, you don't look at my children, you actually look at my grandchildren. God wants us that we can transfer this vision, this vision of the purpose of living to bring transformation and to bring change for the glory of God even to our grandchildren. And uh, there is this example that was given about how to, to lead, especially in our families, to our children. And there is the example given of the elephant, how it guides its children and protects its children. And you see usually the elephant's calf will be in front and uh, it will be leading from behind as you can see in that picture. And uh, usually when there are even many of them, the curve is actually put in between. But there is the other way that the duck does lead its cheeks. Um, and you can see the duck leads from the front and uh, trust that the cheeks are following and following the example of wading through that water. And sometimes we find we are overprotecting our children such that uh, we are thinking about their well-being, about their safety, and about how their lives can succeed. But we do not lead them like the duck does through the challenges of life and for them to learn from us in the way that we are practicing our Christian life. And I want to challenge us that indeed, if we want to see this life and this lifestyle lived in the next generation and in the generations to come, we must know that the family is sacred and we must safeguard that sacredness through upholding teachings of the word of God and leaving them, demonstrating them in the way that they can be able to see. But the second thing that is mentioned around the table of the family is communion. And uh, I know that that, I want to assume it actually happens, especially when we want to eat together. Uh, we are around the table and we are eating together. And you can see that this is what the disciples were doing in this first church. There was communion. And communion is about caring and sharing together. Breaking the, pay, uh, the, the, the bread around the table, rejoicing with each other, but also carrying each other's pains and also the hopes that we have. And there needs to be practical ways of supporting each other, and that needs to be seen in the context of the family. Probably with your brothers and sisters, with your spouses, with your children, there needs to be mutual support within the family. Such that even as we see things come to us in the church, then we are asking what has been happening within the family context. And we need not to forget each other within the family. Sometimes you find some of us exerting much more than others. Probably as um, as brothers and sisters and one child and the other but this is the challenge of being a community even in the context of the family we talk of communion and community within the church but this needs to be first seen within the family and the family is a place where those relationships need to be so strong that people will find belonging and they will find uh, support from within there such that they don't have to go and look for it outside. And I can say that these are some of the reasons why we see people belonging to all kinds of societies. And we have heard of even people belonging to secret societies where they want to find confidence, where they can feel a sense of belonging and acceptance, and they can also 
have trust with each other. But if we had families being strong in this way of building trust, supporting each other, supporting one another even in spiritual matters, then we would not have some of these strange ways of people looking for associations out there and getting into covenants that are going to be destructive even to their families. So our families need to offer care and communion to protect people from long uh, associations. And a Christian family is bowed by the blood not only of birth, but the blood of Jesus Christ. You can imagine there is no other people that would be closer to each other than people who belong to one another through the bloodline, but also have come into communion through Jesus Christ, that they are also bowed by the blood of Jesus Christ. And so, let's not look for what we want out there, away from ourselves. Let it be within, beginning from the family, that we can have that communion and support for one another. And families should not have differentiation of classes and status. We should reach out to each other in spite of our life, our life status and where we have gotten into. And um, this would be one of the ways for us to overcome the spirit that rules in the world when we have this strong communion within our families, in the table of our families, that these needs are being met. And uh, in Colossians chapter 3, verse 8 to 9, which has been read to us, there is something important there that is mentioned for us to build strong relationships within the family setting, um, the Bible says that we should uh, speak to one another with honesty and speaking truth free. Colossians chapter 3, verse, uh, verse 8 and 9. Let me read it to us. But now you must get rid of yourselves of all such things of these anger, rage, malice, slander, and feel the language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, since you have taken off from uh, your old self with its practices, and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge and in the image of the Creator God. That is the purpose of God even for the family. But we know that sometimes within families, there are lies. People are not honest to each other. There are things that they are hiding from each other. And that breaks the communion and the relationship that should be there and the trust that needs to be built within the family. And that is a warning for us if we want us to have strong communion within our families as the unit of transformation of the society. But the last thing that I want to mention to us concerning the sacredness of the family and for that to be lived within our family settings is continued growth that you see in Acts chapter 2, verse 40, uh, 43 and 47. The Bible says, everyone in that fellowship of believers in that first church, which you can also call a family, is that everyone was filled with awe and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. And then verse 47, praising God, enjoying the favor of all the people, and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. And you can see the things that were happening in the context of this fellowship of believers. And we want to see this fellowship of believers within our families. 
that God wants to see a mark of growth and a, mass, a mark of increase and a mark of flourishing within our family. Remember the purpose that God has through us as individuals and through this unit as the means of changing, changing the society, bringing people into restoration through Christ. Is that we want to see even those signs and wonders and miracles and God's intervention and testimonies that will be coming from what God is doing in the context of our devotion to the apostles' teachings and to our time of prayer within the family. Uh, sometimes we ask people to give testimonies. I don't know whether uh, people don't want to open up to say what God is doing. Or is it like you don't see much that is happening? But God would want not just to perform these great things of power and testimonies of intervention in the congregation of the church when we meet on Sunday, but he, is, he wants to do that within our own setting of meeting together in the family as it was happening in this place. And you see... The Bible, especially in the book of Acts, mostly talking about even places where people are meeting at home. And if you read uh, in several scriptures, in the book of uh, Romans chapter 16 and verse 3, it talks about a church that was meeting uh, with Aquila and Pericera's home. That there is a church that was meeting there. He talks about uh, in Colossians chapter 4 verse 15 that there was a church that was meeting in the house of Laodicea and Nympha's house. And in uh, Philemon chapter 1 and verse 2, Philemon was also meeting with uh, other brethren who were meeting in his house. And remember that he was one of the prominent leaders of that time. And they were meeting in his house. And you can imagine that this was a family that has invited other families that they can even expand their fellowship. And this is a mark of growth. And God would want us to have families that can be open even to others on the matters of worshiping and studying the word of God together. And that is why we have life groups even in this church. Because our emphasis is not the gathering on Sunday. But it is what happens in our small groups. It's what happens in your family and when one family meets with another. What we could actually call today our family, uh, home churches. And if those home churches are effective, then even this bigger family of our meeting on Sunday will be even more effective. And I can say that the church congregation should not, um, is, is, is just an extension of what is happening in the family gatherings. And it cannot replace what is happening in the families. Unless if we take the step to go and implement that which we are challenged to do from our gathering here on Sunday, it cannot replace what should be happening throughout the week in our small groups and in our family settings. And so, God wants to see growth in our families, not just growing economically, not just growing academically, but growing, multiplying in terms of our faith, but also inviting others to this faith through our families. It's not outreach that will happen when we come together as a congregation and we want to go to a particular place and reach out to people with the gospel. But it is even what would be happening in that unit. And I want us to remember today that this is what God wants to use to change our community, to change our area, and to change our nation. And if this change does not begin within our small unit of the family, it will not happen in the bigger family of the nation. And so God wants to see that these miracles are happening 
God wants to see that there are others who are coming to faith when they relate with us and when they see what uh, we are living for as a family. That we are living for the honor of God and for that which is sacred. It's not just for that which is of today and passing, but that which is eternal. And this is what Paul actually emphasizes in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 1. And this is what I want to read even as we come to the end of our sharing today. Colossians chapter 3 that had, has been read to us. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 1. It says, Since then you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on other things. For you have died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. The sacredness of what should be happening in the family. That sometimes we set our minds on the things that concern us today, about our well-being today, and our living here today, and excelling in life and succeeding in this life here today. But we do not remember to point our children, to point our family members and those that are within our circles to that which is eternal. Lifting our eyes to that which is above. It's about Christ. It's about focusing on Christ. And it's not about that which is temporal, but that which is eternal. And that is what God wants us to safeguard. And as I said, sometimes we spend so much time, we devote ourselves to that which is present here today, which is good to do, but we forget that which God wants us to remember that will remain eternally. Therefore, even as we come to the conclusion of this um, sharing today, we remember that God wants to use the family for transformation of the nation, of the peoples, of the languages, and that is the mission of God in the world. I don't know whether you understand your purpose as an individual and the purpose that should be there for your family. But we can have a fresh start. Probably you have not been having this kind of devotions that we are talking about. But we can begin afresh. We can trust God to use our families to impact the world for him. Let us pray together. Lord, we want to thank you so much because you have given us a privilege to belong to a family and even to raise families. And we want to thank you for each one of us and we want to thank you for the purpose that you have for us as individuals. That we would know and love you as Lord and also to proclaim you. And we want to pray that you are going to help us as we look at our family devotion to you, devotion to your word and to prayer, that you are going to help us not to just dwell on the things that are of today, but the things that are eternal. And we are praying for your grace upon each one of us, and we pray that our eyes would be open to see that which you have as the purpose for our families. Lord Almighty, I want to pray even for growth, we want to pray for increase in every dimension. And that, oh God, whichever area we might have neglected concerning the well-being of our families, concerning the growth and the increase and the impact of our families, we pray that you are going to help us. And particularly, oh God, I pray that there will be joy and there will be fulfillment that will come from you in all our families and that you will use us to glorify your name in our communities 
are in our nation. And now as we come to the end of our service, I want to read for us some word in the book of Ephesians chapter 3 where God mentions about the family that we all should belong to, the family of God through Jesus Christ, Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 15. And the Bible says, For this reason I knew before the Father from whom his whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner man so that Christ may dwell in your heart through faith. And I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together in your families to grasp how wide, how long, how high and deep the love of Christ is. And now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work in us. To him be glory in the church and in our families, in Christ Jesus through all generations, forever and ever. Amen. And uh, as we join together in the words of the grace, I don't know whether there is any visitor in our midst. I know those who are here before they, they left, and I don't know whether there is any visitor. We'd want to give um, our visitors the privilege of getting out first and being received by our ushers uh, so that we can be sure not to, uh, to be unable to connect with you. So if you are a visitor, even if you have not lifted up your hand, uh, Kaidre, um, will give you the privilege of getting out first. But let's all stand up and join together in the words of the grace. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen. So let's allow our visitor, I guess she could be the only one, uh, to walk out first and then the rest of us can walk here. Yeah. Any visitor in our midst, thank you so much. The Lord bless you and the Lord be with you and uh, keep you until we meet again. Thank you. <laughs>